That's the witness heaven. Good morning, Mr. Selega. Good morning, everybody. Morning, Chairperson. Are we ready? We are ready, Chairperson. Yes. Chairperson, today is the hearing of, or the leading of testimony of Mr. Brian Molife. Mr. Molife is legally represented. I would uh, allow the legal representatives to place themselves on record. Uh, yes, they may do that either from where they are seated. If they put on the, if yeah, if there is no, they can go to the podium. But somebody must just sanitize before they go there. Uh, uh, Deputy Chief Justice, together with uh, Mr. Tsepe and Mr. Skakane, uh, on the instructions of, Ms. of um, Malife attorneys, we are here for um, uh, Mr. Brian Malife. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Masul. Yes, Mr. Selega. Thank you, Chairperson. Mm -hmm. Chairperson, Mr. Malefa is here. I envisage that he is ready to take the oath of affirmation. Yes. Good morning, Mr. Malefa. Good morning, Chairperson. Thank you. Please administer the oath of affirmation. Please state your full names for the record. Brian Molefe. Do you have any objection to taking the prescribed affirmation? No objection. Do you solemnly affirm that the evidence will give will be the truth, I the whole it. truth and nothing else but the truth? If so, please raise your right hand and say, I truly affirm. I truly affirm. Thank you. You may be seated. <laughs> Thank yes, you, Chairperson. Chairperson, the bundle we will be using is exhibit ESCOM bundle 17, 1, 7, exhibit U38, exhibit U38, that's where you find Mr. Malefe's affidavit together with the annexes. Mr. Malefe, I'll ask you to go there as well. Oh, my... Leonard friend, Mr. Masuku, seeks to put certain things on record. Chairperson well, you, you, I was expecting you to first uh, indicate for the benefit of the public where Mr. what Mr. Mulefe will be yes. testifying about, will be questioned about, and um, so that the public will follow. Maybe you should do that, and then once you are done with that, uh, Mr. Masuku can address me. Thank you, Chair. Yes, Mr. Molefe, I should say at the outset that his name features in many things, a couple of issues, from Transnet to ESCOM and uh, to Parliament, but he's called by the ESCOM Extreme Chairperson to focus on matters that pertain to ESCOM, and that deals with he, Mr. Molefe's secondment, how he was seconded to, uh, to ESCOM from Transnet, deals with Mr. Molefe's uh, decision making in regard to what he found to be the cooperation agreement and fourth addendum between ESCOM and Optimum, how he dealt with that, he will explain in regard to uh, the decisions he made. And um, to the extent that he can, and I know that he was not personally involved in certain decisions. 
Regarding the two prepayments decisions, uh, the 1.68 billion rand decision that was made by the board and the 659 million rand prepayment decision made by the board. Uh, he can explain to the extent he can. And we will, he will also deal with the penalties that were that ESCOM sought to impose against OCM and how that matter ultimately got resolved. Together with that chairperson is the interaction between ESCOM and the DMR on the one hand, and in particular the approach Mr. Malefe and Dr. Ngubani makes to Mr. Ramakludi in regard to that. Mr. Malefe has indicated to me that he would like to traverse other issues, particularly in regard to the, PP, uh, the public protector's report, um, but he will do so in due course. Chairperson, there are other matters that uh, might crop up during the, the uh, leading of his evidence, and if Mr. Malefe is not ready on those, we have uh, indicated or agreed with him that he would uh, ask for your permission to either file an affidavit, seek for more time in order to deal with those matters. Uh, well, one, the one matter which uh, should be mentioned is that uh, uh, he will come back at some stage to deal with matters relating to Transnet. Yes. Uh, so, generally speaking, today he will not be dealing with Transnet uh, matters. Correct, Chairperson. Yeah. Correct. Okay, all right. That's correct. I've conveyed that much also to Mr. Malefe and the legal yes. team. Yeah. Okay, all right. Then Mr. Masugu can address me if he wishes to address me. Um, Deputy Chief Justice, <clears throat> thank you for allowing uh, me to raise these preliminary issues. They are raised not to uh, create the impression that um, something is wrong, but in a process like this, these issues ought to be raised so that um, the process is enriched and it is, uh, and it is, it is uh, uh, made a little stronger. I've been, asked to raise, I've been asked and have a duty to raise those issues which concern, um, which concern the appearance of uh, Mr. Bryan. The first is that ESCOM has, a, has filed a civil claim uh, to the amount, I think, of three billion against uh, um, Mr. Bryan and uh, I think 11 other defendants on the very issues that will become advanced by the Commission uh, today. So to the extent that some of the, issues, some of the questions may undermine his uh, defense in the civil claim, we might raise an objection. We hope it doesn't have to come to that, to that, to that, to that level, but uh, he would be entitled to raise a defense uh, on the basis that um, this would, uh, it's not, it's not, it, 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 this would be unfair in, in, in light of the uh, in light of the, the, the pending uh, litigation that is going on on the, on the very same issues that he is canvassing. The second one, you will be aware, Chief Justice, that the, the President has made, made a proclamation, I think it was 2019, if I'm not wrong, in, in respect of which a full-scale investigation was, or was, direct, was ordered uh, uh, by, the, by, the, by, uh, by the President that the SIU must uh, conduct in relation to the ESCO matters. And we, Mr. Malefe informs us that he has been informed that uh, people who work with him 
have been asked for affidavits in relation to that investigation. And at some point, the SIU or whoever is investigating this issue will confront Mr. Mulefe on, the, on, the, on those aspects. We would ask that where it is possible, his right to, uh, his right to not incriminate himself uh, be, be respected if it is raised legitimately, and we hope we do raise it legitimately. And then <clears throat> the last issue really is an issue of, you, you know, if I, I have, having been here a number of times, Chief Justice, if I don't complain, it's just not right. So I'm going to complain about... <laughs> so you are going to complain. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm going to complain about the fact that uh, we did receive the documents on which Mr. Mulefe had to prepare for this hearing quite late. It was on Tuesday, Tuesday night. We, as, as, as legal representatives, were able to access those documents the following day, which was a Wednesday. And we only really had Wednesday and Thursday, and part of, uh, well, today is Friday, to go through the documents that had been sent to us. It does create a problem for Mr. Mulefe because one of the questions we had asked quite early was which aspect, in, which, in respect of which position, was the commission seeking to have Mr. Mulefe come and testify. Because the, 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 the uh, I think it's the Regulation 10, three notice doesn't really point out that he is in fact testifying on the ASCOM issues. And that issue became clearer when we received the letter that I commended and uh, uh, the letter by uh, Mr. Slege, which was a very polite and very fruitful letter to engage with. So we, we, we do want to say that there is invariably prejudice that relates to the detail that you may require from Mr. Mulefe in respect of the issues that he got documents late on. So in that respect, we would ask that if he's, he does say that he has not engaged with certain aspects of your question, that you allow him the opportunity to do so in, in writing uh, after having gotten enough time with uh, his lawyers to engage with those questions that you'd, you'd be wishing him to, to engage with. <clears throat> so, I mean, subject to any questions that you may have, Chief Justice, those are the remarks that I thought are important to record so that we understand the context in which Mr. Malefe is going to be giving his evidence. It is the context of a civil and criminal liability that he's facing and the context in which the documents had been sent to him by the commission and the limited time that he had to prepare for those documents. Absolutely, the final one, Chief Justice, he, he does want to um, have a, he has a statement that he wants to make uh, in which he, it may clarify his mind about the things that the Commission is, uh, is, uh, is, is investigating. If, if, it, <clears throat> if it's permitted, Mr. Bryan is ready to give that statement. No, thank you, Mr. Masugo. I think uh, uh, to the extent that uh, uh, he may have received certain documents late and therefore hasn't had uh, an adequate opportunity to prepare himself on certain documents or issues. Um, there will be no difficulty where he is not able to answer because he needs more time to look at those documents. There will be no difficulty in uh, arranging that uh, he can deal with those um, at some other time, or he might file an affidavit and then uh, he might be asked questions when he comes back. As I indicate, he must still come back to deal with uh, uh, non-ESCOM matters. Uh, so so there, there would be no difficulty. Um, every effort is made to make sure that uh, there is fairness. Uh, we might not always succeed, but we'll keep on trying to, 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 to make sure. So there, there'll be no, no, no difficulty in regard to documents that he really hasn't had enough time to, to look at because the um, commission gave him those late. Uh, with regard to uh, the question of criminal matters and uh, uh, the, the effect that he may, in regard to some question, wish to uh, not to give an answer uh, uh, in order not to incriminate himself, um, that uh, uh, if and when that is raised, we will all deal with it then. Um, whether or not uh, anything that may fall under the civil action 
but not under the privilege not to incriminate yourself. Whether or not that could be a ground not to answer, we will we'll deal with it if and when it arises. It might not arise. So, so, uh, but that, that, that's fine. Let's see how it goes and, uh, and where there are challenges or concerns, uh, we'll deal with them. Thank you, Deputy Chief Justice. Thank you. Um, I, I will allow Mr. Mulef uh, the opportunity to uh, uh, read or make uh, some remarks or statements before he gives evidence, as I understand stand from you, Mr. Musugu, that he would like that opportunity. Uh, Mr. Mulefe, I have uh, indicated to your counsel that although I have allowed other witnesses to that opportunity, um, from a certain time I've been concerned uh, whether we should insist that we should receive a written statement in advance so that we could see whether uh, it will implicate any third parties or any other people in wrongdoing so that um, uh, the relevant procedural uh, issues can be attended to. But uh, my understanding from your counsel is that uh, your statement uh, should not uh, have anything like that. Uh, so, um, after Mr. Before Mr. Selega starts leading your evidence, I will allow you the opportunity to either read the statement or make the remarks that you, you wish to make. Mr. Selega? Thank you, Chair. Should I? Uh, are you ready to start or do you still have some housekeeping issues to attend to? No, I am ready to start, Chairperson. Oh, okay. I, I could identify the file and um, have... Well, well, I think let's, uh, let, let's allow Mr. Mulefe to make his remarks or read his statement, and then after that we, we, we you can yes, then, uh, take it from there. Thank you, Yes, Chair. Mr. Mulefe? Thank you, Chairperson. Let me start by expressing my gratitude for allowing me to crave your indulgence in making the statement. Chairperson, during the testimony of Dr. Ben Gubani, you asked a pertinent question, which in my opinion, if answered, will put into context and clarify the events that took place at ESCOM during my tenure there in 2015 and 2016. Yes, just hang on, Mr. Mulefe. I think you might wish to bring the mic a little closer to you so that uh, you, are, you are loud enough and you can keep your mic on throughout. Uh, it will, you don't have to switch it off when I'm speaking or when he's speaking. You can just keep it on all the time. No, yes, you, you can I, continue. I, I just want everyone to hear what you say properly. Is, is no, your I don't, voice I don't want to cough into as... it and give the whole country corona. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Jefferson, uh, during that testimony, you referred to a question that needs to be put to optimum coal mine along the lines of, and I quote what you said, how did you allow whoever signed on your behalf to sign a contract that the price would be the same for 10 years or more. Were they sleeping or what? Or what was? How could you have signed such a contract? Nobody signs such a contract, close quote. Those were your words, Chairperson. And um, unfortunately, Chairperson, these questions were not put to OCM. Because I think, although it was during Dr. Ngubani's evidence, you were asking about about OCM's lack of, or how, the reason behind what they did. But the answers to these questions are at the heart of how and why we find ourselves where we are today. While they were not asked, nor had they directly answered these questions, Glencoe did shed some light as to how they had put themselves in that precarious situation, out of which they were demanding to be rescued by ESCO. 
Glencore did not sign the contract that you refer to. Glencore bought the contract with the company that had signed the contract. This is in the evidence of Mr. Efron before this commission, and it was on the 13th of January. Uh, uh, sorry, it was. Yeah, it was on the 13th of January 2020 that he gave this evidence that they had bought that company together with the SCA. CSA, Coal Supply Agreement. Although Mr. Efron is a chartered accountant, he admitted that Glencore did not conduct a due diligence on Optimum prior to the acquisition of the company and the contract. Nor had they bothered to acquaint themselves with how the coal supply agreement worked. This was in page three of his statement. Sorry, in, in page three of his statement. Instead of conducting due diligence and understanding how the coal supply agreement worked, they did something extraordinary, Chairperson. They sold 9.64% of the shares in the newly acquired company to Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa a political heavyweight, and made him chairman of the newly acquired company. That was a strategic decision to use the former Secretary General of the African National Congress and former Secretary General of the National Union of Mine Workers, a member of the National Executive Committee of the ANC at the time. They knew that the profitability of the company could only come from a successful renegotiation of the coal price and ignoring by ESCO of the penalties that were accumulating at the time. Mr. Ramaphosa was their bet. The profitability of Optimum was therefore dependent on the peddling of political influence and the extent to which Glencore would be able to exert pressure on ESCOM directors and management, and not on the fundamentals of the company that they had acquired. This, in my opinion, was the source of Glencore's problems. They had made their bed and needed to lie on it. It was unfair and arrogant of them to demand, as they were doing, that ESCOM should effectively pay for the irresponsible manner in which they had tied themselves into the proverbial knot. You observed, Chairperson, that on my arrival at ESCOM, there was, and I quote you, a complete change of attitude on the part of ESCOM on the deal that had been proposed and had been supported by various levels of management. Close quote. You were referring to the deal that had been entered into by ESCOM management and Glencore to save Glencore's skin from the consequences of purchasing a company having not conducted due diligence. ESCOM management and Glencore were in the process of subverting Section 38 of the PFMA, Section 38, 1C, Roman figure 1, which talks about the duty of a state-owned entity or a state body to collect what is owed to it. On the 8th of December 2020, during the course of these hearings, the evidence leader, Advocate Selika, was at pains to explain how Glencore had fallen into hardship because the export price of coal had taken a nosedive. Dr. Ngubani tried to explain to the commission that when the international coal price was high and Optimum enjoyed super profits, they had not shared their spoils with, with ESCO. What was unfortunately uh, lost in that exchange is the fact that Optimum 
was a cost plus mine. It had been built with ESCOM's capital and had been given a 40-year contract. ESCOM had responsibility for the mining costs and in return, Optimum received a fixed margin. ESCOM was, and then I, th I think at some point during the hearings you referred to this as a, an absurd arrangement. ESCOM was unfairly excluded in participating in the super profits of the time when times were good. And yet, it was expected to fork out more capital, forgo its legitimate price expectations, and subsidize rich international corporations when the times were bad. That is the situation that we found ourselves in. You correctly pointed out, Chairperson, that ESCOM had a legitimate contract with Optimum. In terms of that contract, we at ESCOM were supposed to get from them coal at the price of 150 rand per ton until 2018. Those were the terms of the contract. Whether they liked it, whether they didn't like it, those were the terms of the contract. In addition, they had accumulated penalties in terms of that contract to the value of two billion. Evidence was led in this commission that that two billion was not a figment of, the, my, of my imagination. That two billion was calculated, had accumulated from 2012. I think it was Mr. Bester who said that he actually had calculated the two billion. And uh, uh, during his hearing on that matter, uh, there was debate about whether or not it should have been uh, a million more or a million less, but it was about two billion. Optimum demanded that the price of coal be increased to 530 rand per ton and that the penalties of two billion should be written off. Somebody mentioned 530 the other day and uh, Advocate Selega jumped and said it was not 530, it was 400 and something. But Advocate Selega, when they came to me for the first time, the figure was 530. It may or may not have been written, but that is what I clearly recall. And they later on reduced it to what you refer to. But the original demand, at least to me, uh, it was 530 rand per ton from 150. It was their opening negotiating position. 530 rand from 150 rand. An increase from 150 rand to 530 rand per, ta per ton would have meant a transfer of 6 billion rand from ESCOM to Glencore over a period of three years. 2015 to 2018. Add to this the two billion write-off of the penalties that they were asking for. The amount that Glencore wanted ESCOM to pay for their original mistake of not doing due diligence was eight billion rand. Eight billion rand, Chairperson. Your observation that there was a complete change of attitude on the part of ESCOM on the deal that had been proposed and had been supported by various levels of management when I arrived at ESCOM is absolutely correct. I'm not ashamed of this change of attitude that occurred. When I arrived, I was having ESCOM's interests and those of the country at heart. What was happening was wrong on many fronts. It was literally going to financially ruin ESCO. But there was an added issue to this. The Glenco position would have seen an inequitable situation. The poor and most vulnerable in the country would subsidize the dealings of the rich. There was no way that I could, with a clean conscience, attend public gatherings and meetings and shout from the rooftops that Soweto residents needed to pay their debt to ESCO. 
when I was allowing international corporates to disadvantage ESCOM on many fronts. Moreover, I could not face ESCOM employees and unions and tell them that their bonuses will not be paid or that their salary increases will be zero. Their bonuses will not be paid as was nearly the case in 2015. And that we had no funds to fix the apartheid wage gap that still exists between black and white employees of ESCOM. There is still an apartheid wage gap at ESCOM. While rich international corporations were duly, unduly exploiting ESCOM. As I have stated, the payments to Glencore would have sunk ESCOM. You will recall, Chairperson, that this was at the time when load shedding was becoming the norm. I could not, Chairperson, say to South Africans that load shedding will continue because we do not have enough money to conduct planned backlog maintenance on our electricity generating fleet and still allowed 8 billion to be unjustly transferred to Glencore. When I arrived at ESCOM, a de facto board of the company had been established outside of the company in the form of a war room in the presidency. Management had to report to this war room. Ms. Mazia Zimokolo was here yesterday, and she explained, Chairperson, to you how the war room demanded meetings with management and uh, officials of the Department of Public Enterprises every Friday at 7 a.m. Every Friday, they had to present reports. So when I got there, the biggest activity that was happening at ESCOM was preparing war room reports. From Wednesday, we must start preparing the reports, make sure that they are ready for Friday, 7 a.m. Then it's weekend. Then Monday, Tuesday, we work. And then Wednesday, we start preparing reports again. It was an untenable situation. There was a board, a de facto board, that was outside of the company. And what is even more strange, Chairperson? is that there has been evidence here, including by Ms. Mokolo, who was here yesterday, that members of the board, the legitimate board, the legal board of ESCOM, had not seen, were not seeing those war room reports. So management was reporting to the war room. But it, it gets even better, Jefferson. The deputy president of the republic, Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa was the chairperson of the war room. He was, in fact, the de facto chairperson of ESCOM, the de facto chairperson of a de facto board that was outside the company. He was the de facto chairperson and uh, had started playing this role directly from being chairperson of Optimum. When the deal was done in 2012 and he was sold shares or he bought shares, he was made chairperson. 2014, he became deputy president and chairperson of the war room. One would have expected corporate governance requires that there must be a cooling off period precisely for things like this. Here is a person who was engaged in saying we must renegotiate renegotiate. That, that contract was signed in 2014, the contract that I found at ESCOM. We must renegotiate effectively 8 billion rand. Moves and becomes the de facto chairperson of the company. In fact, he sold his shares to Pembani. I'm not sure if that was arm's length, but he sold his shares to Pembani. But at the time, when I got to ESCOM, and when he was deputy president, and he was chairing the, um, the war room, the deal had not gone through. It was awaiting competition commission approval. I think that was granted in August. So, 
I suspect there may have been conflicts. But then, then again, I'm not an expert. The membership of the war room included people like uh, Professor Eberhardt from UCT, who has never, in my presence, uttered an intelligent academic or sane word about electricity or corporate strategy. I quickly came to realize that the war room was not about load shedding and turning ESCOM around. Something else was happening. ESCOM senior managers were being distracted from fighting load shedding by being made to attend endless meetings at which they were supposed to give an ending and meaningless reports. I was uncomfortable with the war room and stopped attending its meetings. If the war room had been doing its work diligently, it would have solved the load shedding crisis before I arrived at ESCO. I was relieved when President Zuma closed it down in favor of giving management a fair chance at fighting load shedding and turning the economy around, and, and turning the company around. Under my leadership, and the leadership of, uh, and, the, and the leadership and technical expertise of people like Mr. Coco, uh, other engineers, the engineers at ESCOM, the guardians as they call them, the employees of ESCOM, who, when I was there, became very invigorated and determined to end load shedding. We defeated load shedding in August 2015. On the 8th of August 2015, we stopped load shedding. And we never had load shedding again for three years after I had left ESCOM. Load shedding came back to ESCOM after Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa, following the one billion rand Nazarek conference, was appointed president of the country. That's when load shedding came back. And after he was appointed president of the country, and he in turn appointed the smooth-talking and dictatorial Pravin Gordon as Minister of Public Enterprises. The less I say about Pravin Gordon, the better. As you see, Chairperson, despite his smooth talking, public enterprises are failing, and it appears that they are on a course to be sold to private interests. My suspicion is that like the javelin, they will be thrown over the fence and be caught at the later stage. It's just a suspicion. To put it mildly, Chairperson, the situation made me sick. I found the behavior of Glencoe and that of Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa to be revolting. Mr. Ramaphosa must have known about what Glencore sought to achieve. He was the chairperson of the company that was bought without a due diligence. He was chairperson when the penalties were imposed. He was still chairperson of Optimum when the unlawful agreement that sought to increase the price of coal from 150 and set aside the penalties was negotiated with certain members of ESCOM staff in 2014. He knew that he was being used for his political standing and hoped to influence matters to Glencore's favor. He had a, an interest in the matter, 9.64% interest. He is not naive, and he has been dealing with these corporates which gave him his riches. Mr. Machila Gogo, who I interrogated at length about this agreement that was entered into before I arrived, told me that the board had not sanctioned that agreement. He also told me that the official who had signed it had no authority to do so. But this is hearsay evidence, which I shall not burden you with.
Although it is yes, evidence, Jefferson, at least I know it was Mr. Koko. I'm not telling you it was somebody's brother that I don't know. I hope that Mr. Koko will shed more light on this aspect when the commission ends its fascination with the suspensions of the executives in the hearing of, this, of his evidence. Dr. Ben Gubani and members of his board understood the situation perfectly well. For them, I received the blessing to do what was right. And for that, I'm thankful. It is a pity that this commission on state capture missed an opportunity to investigate the nature of the cost plus mines and 40-year contracts and what is currently collapsing ESCOM. It is truly an injustice to the entire economy. If this were to be investigated properly, we will all see the real problems from which we are, we are being diverted. I believe, with the blessing of Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa and Pravin Gordon, I find it to be strange that the focus is on Tegeta, given the fact that the Te Tegeta supplied less than 4% of ESCOM coal, while in 2015, four other white rich companies supplied more than 80% of ESCOM coal to the value in excess of 40 billion rand per annum with 40-year contracts. It goes into the trillions, Chairperson, over the 40-year period. And yet, we're here talking about this meeting, that meeting, concerning a company that was quite literally not supplying much. While some of us did not have the privilege of explaining our side of the story in an interview with the former public protector with respect to Optimum Coal Mine. It is clear that Glencore had unfettered access to her and were able to impress on her what their beef with ESCOM was. Mr. Efron testified in this commission uh, on page seven of, he, of the transcript during his hearing on the 27th of uh, February, 2019. He testified that he, they did have a meeting with the Office of the Public Protector, something that I was not afforded as a person against whom they were complaining. She did not bother to interview me for my side of the story as is required by the Public Protector Act. Section 7.9 talks about what the public protector must do when a person is implicated. She must inform the person and give the person an opportunity to be heard and to interview the witnesses that came with the evidence. She did none of that. Instead, She proceeded in unprecedented haste to write and label as final a report which has been used by the media to lynch certain people, including myself, and which gave rise to this commission. This commission is the is the child of a report that of, of a report that was written in very suspicious circumstances. That is when Ms. Madonsela was leaving and was in a hurry, as if there was not going to be a public protector anymore in South Africa. Glencore is a multi-billion rent company. Their BE partner, Mr. Ramaphosa, subsequently rose to become the deputy president and then president of the country. It is rumored that, and this happened without any cooling off period, it is rumored that his campaign to become president of the ANC was financed to the tune of one billion rand. This was unprecedented in the African National Congress. I dare say that it was not in line with the culture, values, and ethos of the ANC 
that I had come to know and which I continue to be a member of. Mere mortals like myself simply do not stand a chance when we pit ourselves against these powerful forces who are trying to extort 8 billion rand from a state-owned entity, ESCO. Constitutional bodies wrote powerful reports about us, and no one dared to question their procedural fairness, their disrespect for natural justice and the Constitution, because the right to be heard, I believe, is in the Constitution, or even the unlawfulness in the manner in which the Public Protector's Office under Tulima Donsela had conducted itself by disregarding Section 79 of the Act. Nevertheless, I continue to have faith in our Constitution. The principle of transformative constitutionalism and the rule of law. I'm aware, Chairperson, that even as I make this statement, law enf enforcement agencies may be ready to pounce and charge me with criminal acts. I appear before you and state that my conscience is clear. This I know because the spokesperson of the SIU, Mr. Kanyar, said during a television interview about the pending civil case relating to ESCOM against myself and others that they had not concluded their investigations, that they had not interviewed me, and that the civil court process against myself and others is part of their investigations on myself. The abuse of law enforcement and constitutional bodies is not a myth. But no amount of manipulation of state institutions and agencies and intimidation will deter me. It is unfortunate that the courts appear to have also fallen to the narrative of the so-called state capture, which, by the way, Chairperson, you must still establish whether or not it existed. This was the purpose of this commission. But people talk as if you've already made your findings. Sometimes even your own tongue slips and talks about it as if there is a finding. When this nightmare is over, our country will return to normalcy. I hope that after this nightmare, some amongst us will desist from political lynching and purges and rather focus on the sacred task of rebuilding our country. I will assist the Commission as best as I can. Just for the record, Chairperson, I submitted this affidavit that is in front of you in May. I have written numerous letters to the Commission requesting to come. And I was told that I'm not scheduled and I must wait and so on until December. And in December, to my surprise, what I get is a summons. A summons to a person who's been begging to come. I felt the Commission has a right to issue summons, but I felt like it was unnecessarily hostile. Because all it took, even if I had been sent an SMS message, Chairperson, I would have been here. After the summons was issued, the first thing that we did is we received your summons, we are happy to come, please indicate what it is about. Which matter? Is it Transnet, ESCOM? Is it ESCOM? Which ESCOM matters? No reply. No reply. Right through December, no response. Until three days before the day on which I was supposed to come. Tuesday. Tuesday night at 10 o'clock at night, we received the documents. 1,400 pages of documents. I've spent the last two days going through the documents. I did not sleep last night because I did not want to come here and say to you, Chairperson, can we have a postponement? I wanted to engage. After all, I had said that I had been ready for a very long time. But it is unfortunate in the manner in which this was done. It is also unfortunate that it may portray me, for lack of not going through some of the parts of the documents, 
as a person who is not prepared or who is reluctant to appear before the commission. Despite the fact that I was advised, legal advice was, you must tread this carefully, this is very serious, you can't go in without having gone through the documents properly, I insisted that I will appear. That is why, Chairperson, I've been seeking to come and present my side of the story. A natural justice right that was denied me, that was denied to me by the former public protector. My heart is at ease. I'm ready to face the consequences of following the dictates of my conscience. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mulefe. Uh, I think there are certain parts of your statement which make me wish uh, we had received it in advance uh, to give it to uh, certain people or at least warn, warn them about it. But um, I think I can understand that there may be different views about whether there would be a need to, to do that. But it may be that if I had, we had received it in advance, we would have preferred to err on the side of caution uh, and, 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 and given them. So I just make this point to indicate that to the extent that either you or your counsel might have taken the view that there is nothing that implicates anybody. I'm not, I'm not uh, criticizing that. I'm not criticizing that, but you know, I, I, I may have preferred to err on the side of caution. So, so I just wanted to, to make that point. Um, you want to say something before I proceed? Yes, Chairperson. Mr. Ramaphosa is mentioned in my, in my affidavit of uh, 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 May 2020. And not only do I mention him, I also talk about this issue of the shares and so on. I don't know if after reading that affidavit, or how seriously that affidavit was taken, yes. there were any further investigations. Yes. What surprised me yes. is that there was no follow-up. Yeah. There was, there's nothing, even in the papers that I received on Tuesday, yeah. Nothing says we would like to talk about this issue. Yeah. This issue that I consider to be the most critical. Yes. I'm not raising it for the first time. It's yes. in my affidavit. Yes. No, 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 that, that, that's, that's fine. That, that, that was the first point I wanted to make. The second point I want to make is that uh, I like the idea that uh, you have taken the attitude that uh, uh, you want to assist the commission as much as you can. And I think from the statement you have made, you have even said, uh, yes, I agree that when I came to ESCOM, there was a change of attitude, uh, but there were reasons for that. And uh, uh, I will deal with the reasons why that, uh, that, that was so. And you have said, you sought to act in the interests of ESCOM. That's why there was, an, uh, there was that change of attitude. So your statement gives me the impression that you are ready to engage with issues with a view to placing the facts as you know them before the commission on the various issues, but also to give the commission your perspective, because sometimes the facts are the same but these perspectives are different from different people. So I have said all along that as the commission, we want to get all the perspectives from different people. We want to get facts from everybody. Um, and of course, what has uh, happened in some instances is that certain people have come forward to the commission and give given it affidavits, given it information about 
the facts as they, as they see them and the, their perspective of issues. And then others who might have a dif different perspective on the same issues, some of them have not come forward to say, these are our perspective on this, perspectives on the same issues, or these are the facts as we know them. The result of that is that until all sides give the commission their perspectives and they, the facts as, as they see, see them, uh, whenever there is only uh, evidence and perspective from one side and the other side doesn't come forward, it puts the commission in a place where it only knows one side. And um, so I am quite clear, and I've said it before, that we want all perspectives. We want facts from all sides. Um, we, and so that when we make findings, we make findings uh, based on all sides effects and all sides perspectives. So I think your statement at least gives me the impression that you, you, you are ready to give the commission the facts as you know them and your own perspective on the various issues, which is, which is quite uh, um, important. I, um, I know that you, you said that uh, sometimes even uh, from me, sometimes when it comes to state capture, you say there is a slip of the tongue. <laughs> I think, <laughs> well, all I can, I can say is from the beginning of the commission up to now, I've tried to make it very clear whenever I talk about state capture that I'm talking about the alleged state capture. I think that anyone who examines uh, what I've said about state capture in the hearings and in media briefings will find at least that most of the time I'm talking about alleged state capture or state capture if it is proved uh, that it existed. But I can't say that when you examine all statements I've made from 2018, whether inside the hearing or outside, and you, so you might not find something that you say, oh, okay, well, he does not say now alleged, <laughs> you know. But uh, certainly, uh, there is, um, certainly from my side, that, that, that must still be proved, and I will only uh, make findings when all every evidence has been com completed. So um, I thought I would just mention that. But th thank you very much. I think that. Uh, we should uh, then, uh, I should allow Mr. Selega to, to start. Okay, Mr. Selega. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, Mr. Malefe and I had a collegial uh, exchange um, this morning. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, before you proceed, um, the... uh, it would be good if I could have a copy of your Yes. statement to Mr. Mulefe. I was going to say, my learned mm. friend has indicated he wants to hear yes. Mr. Mr. That, that copy that you have has got some minor edits on it, but there are, uh, yeah, they're just ty 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 typing errors and so on, because we, I finished it literally. Uh, you have one that has, the, in which those minor errors have been corrected? Oh, no, I don't have it with you me. You don't have, because yeah. Because I literally did not yes. sleep and had to come here. So, but okay. it can be made available. Yeah, what, what can be done is this one can be replaced. Yes, with one yes. that uh, has been corrected. That has been properly yeah. edited, because yes. over the last three days have really been a nightmare. Yes, okay. And, and uh, uh, so that, that, that's fine. So it can be replaced with a, a version that uh, reflects uh, that the errors have been corrected. Yes, sir. 
And uh, I wanted to say, uh, uh, Mr. Selega, as well as Mr. Masugu, uh, separately and together, you can apply your minds uh, as to whether uh, this statement was the corrected one that will come, uh, can or should be admitted as, a, as, as an exhibit or not. You, you don't have to... If you are not ready to say the, to say that now, you can tell me later in the day. Chair, sure, I think my inclination will be that it has to. Yes. Because it it uh, makes reference to certain persons. Yeah. The two in particular. Yeah. And uh, I think, all fairness to yeah. them. Yeah. Once it is accepted, yeah. it has to be served on them. Yeah. So that that part of what is said about him doesn't remain yeah. a mere statement yeah. open in the opening address. Yes. I think Mr. Masu wishes to say something on this point. Yes. Chief Justice, they are now demoting me to come and stand behind. Well, well, well <laughs> Mr. Demoting, Masu, why, 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 why are they preventing you from going to the podium? Because you wanted why. to go to the podium. Yes, I, want I think to you must podium. go to the podium. Yes. Yeah, why are they preventing you? <laughs> Just sanitize the, uh, the, 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 the podium and then you can use it. But, uh, but I'm, I'm sure, Mr. Masogo, it's not any attempt at sabotaging you. <laughs> Deputy Chief Justice, I, I'm, I'm in agreement with my learned friend as a view. The, the allegations made in the statement are not light allegations. That's... State capture is what you find in the statement uh, of, of, of Mr. Malefe. But what I would add is that perhaps what should, what should be sent to, the, to those implicated in the statement is not just the written statement that, he, he, that has been handed up to you, but that the transcript of what he, of what he, he, he said, he said yeah. be part of the, of the, of the statement. Said, because yeah. at some point, I think he was elaborating on certain things. Mm -hmm. He would move away from the statement yeah. and elaborate on certain things. So yeah. if, if that could, if that could be, could be done, yes. that, that, would, yes. that would be, that would be, yes. uh, the statement is not, is not lightly met. It's a very serious statement. Yes. So yes. I, I do accept that it is one yeah. that should be um, certainly a major uh, exhibit. Yes. But just uh, taking advantage of the fact that I'm here, I, I made a, an error when I said that I was we instructed by uh, the Molefe attorneys. Yes. It's Molaba attorneys. Oh, okay. But our instructing attorney is, is uh, Mr. Molefe. Oh, okay. Well, yes, uh, so it was, it was a slip of the tongue. There are lots of Molefes. So. <laughs> yes, no, the, right here there are two. You, 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 one can understand <laughs> the, you being confused. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, can, can we take it that in uh, reading this statement, which is not an affidavit, can we take it that uh, Mr. Mlefe was doing so on the understanding that he's under oath, therefore, uh, uh, although it is a statement, but because I see he had already taken an oath, yes. but I, I need to clarify because he may have prepared it. Uh, I, I think I think the Chief Justice he will answer that for himself. Will, yeah. But what we have, yes. we, we canvassed that issue yes. with him, yes. and he has no difficulties uh, uh, changing it into, into, a, into, into an affidavit, affidavit if yes. it should be required yeah. by the uh, yeah. by the commission to do so. Okay. As he says, some of the things he made, some of the allegations he made yeah. are already in yeah. in, his, in, his, uh, in his in his affidavit, so they, yeah. they won't be any yes. deviation from his central yes. mission, which is to tell the commission about uh, what 
real estate capture looks like. <laughs> okay, thank, all right. Thanks, thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Masu. Oh, I, I didn't realize. I hope my watch is right. I didn't realize that we have gone past quarter past eleven. It says half past eleven. Is that the right time? It is the right time, Chair. We have. Oh. We have gone beyond the tea time. Okay, so I think that uh, we should take the tea break now then, so that uh, when we come back, then you can start leading Mr. Mulefe's uh, evidence. Okay, that's, that's uh, in order. We'll take the tea adjournment now. It's half past. We'll resume at quarter to 12. Thank you, Chair. We are adjourned.
Okay, you may proceed, Mr. Selega. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, I think I must just uh, uh, effectively make this announcement that uh, going forward, any witness who wishes to make uh, remarks or um, which are not in an affidavit or statement that has been given to the Commission already should uh, forward uh, his or her statement to the Commission uh, at least seven days before the date of hearing and uh, indicate that uh, they would request to be allowed to read that statement uh, at the Commission. That will give the Commission an opportunity to look at it and uh, see whether uh, anybody should be alerted to it in advance or not. So I uh, just want to make this so that in the future yes, uh, everybody knows what's going to happen. Thank you, Chair. Okay, all right. <coughs> Proceed. Thank you, Chairperson. ESCOM Bundle 17, Chairperson. Exhibit U38. That is the bundle we'll be using. Exhibit U38 contains Mr. Malifa's affidavit. And it's start on page. Page five. Mr. Malifi again, the black pagination at the top left hand corner. You are there, Mr. Malifi? Yes, I am, sir. Thank you. The Affidavit Chairperson runs up to page 38. <coughs> Mr. Malifa, please go to page 38. 38. Go to page 38. <coughs> yes. So that's the last page of the Affidavit. You see the signature there above the name Brian Malifa. Yes, Jefferson. You confirm that to be your signature? Yes, it is indeed, Jefferson. You confirm this entire affidavit to be your affidavit? Yes, and I also confirm that it was signed on the 13th of May, 2020. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mulley. Chairperson, may I beg leave to have it admitted? <coughs> As Exhibit U38.1. And the affidavit of Mr. Brian Mulefe, starting at page 5 of uh, ESCOM Bundle 17, is admitted together with his signatures as Exhibit U38.1. Thank you, Chairperson. <coughs> Chairperson, Mr. Mulefe and I had a friendly discussion this morning, and I told him that Dr. Ngubane remembers him for his charisma and... Uh, Dance. And dan dancing skills. Yeah, and he said he would give us a treat. But now he took a long time in his address. <laughs> so I will simply go straight to the evidence. <laughs> There'll be no time for dancing. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mr. Malefe. <clears throat> um, ample evidence has been laid before us about your secondment to Transnet, I mean to ESCOM from Transnet. Could you tell the chairperson about a little bit about uh, well, where you... Mr. Mr. Mulefe, Mr. Selek. Yes, Chair. You see, Mr. Masugu. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, I think that uh, quite a number of the, in, the initial pages of Mr. Brad Mleffer's uh, affidavit yes, talks Chief. about matters that we don't have to deal with yes. because about the uh, whether his contract was one for an indefinite period or a fixed term and the pension and so on because those matters have been dealt with in litigation. In indeed. So um, you, you don't have to deal with those. I think it's sufficient to deal with 
uh, his secondment. Yes. And uh, when he started at ESCOM on an acting basis, and when he became, um, when he was uh, appointed, and uh, then uh, to go to the real issues. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay, all right. Yes. Yeah, Mr. Malefe, yes, I think a lot of those matters have been dealt with in litigation, in yes. respect of which there has been a yes. judgment. Yes. Now, I have indicated that much uh, yes, the pension okay. payout will not be traversed yeah. in his evidence. Um, <clears throat> but, Mr. Malefe, you could, uh, just before you go into the secondment, um, just tell the chairperson your previous employment prior to coming to ESCOM. If you, if you don't follow my question, you will ask, isn't it? Yes, no, I, it just uh, occurred to me uh, how far back uh, you wanted to go, but... Um, um, I'm sure he just wants the, uh, the, the employer before the ESCOM employer only. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, yes. so um, I, I was... Uh, I, I worked in the... Uh, the office of the Premier in Limpopo under Premier Nwankwara Matlodi <clears throat> as a Chief Director for Strategic Planning. I have worked in the National Treasury um, as a Director uh, in the Budget Office dealing with provincial budgets and uh, I was promoted again to Chief Director dealing with um, provincial budgets. And then I became, uh, sorry, asset management, Ch chief director asset management, which was actually about uh, state-owned entities. The assets were the state-owned entities. In fact, um, um, while I was there, it was during the time when the PFMA was being written. And I was in part of the committee that wrote uh, the parts of the PFMA that uh, relate to state-owned entities. And um, I was promoted to Deputy Director General, uh, Asset and Liability Management, where we managed the, uh, the debt, South Africa's debt, uh, uh, both in um, domestic and international capital markets, the issuing of bonds in the uh, domestic capital markets, and the issuing of bonds in the uh, international capital markets to finance the deficit. Uh, we also did cash management, and um, the chief director who was now doing asset management also reported to me. So it was state-owned entities and debt management. And then uh, I was sent to the uh, public investments commissioners at the time. As a secretary for the commission, uh, we uh, engaged, started a process to change the legislation to convert the public investments commissioners into a corporation uh, because really the PIC was an asset management company and we wanted to professionalize it. When, and when, when, was, was, when was that, uh, Mr. Malefe? I went to the PIC, I think, in 2000 or 2001. I was there until about 2008. I was there for seven years. And the P Public Investments Corporation Act is, was passed in 2004. <laughs> and um, while I was there, we were managing assets. When I, when, I, when I joined, assets under management were about 310 billion rand. And by the time I left in 2000 and, uh, 2008, assets under management were about 950 billion rand, just mm -hmm. short of... Uh, <laughs> just short of one trillion. Mm. Uh, subsequently, I think a bit, a, about a year after I left, the assets went over one trillion <clears throat> and have stayed above one trillion. Mm. And... Um, after 2008? After 2008, where did you go? After 2008, for about a year, I decided maybe I was going to do my own thing and uh, do some private transactions by myself. Oh, let me ask you this. When did you join Transnet? I think it was 2010. 2010. Mm. Um, I think it was 2011. Was it 2011? Yes, there <laughs> 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 You joined yeah. Transnet uh, in 2011. Um, 
uh, earlier, I think it, it, it may have been February or March or thereabouts. Yeah. Chairperson, yeah. I may make mistakes, but it's, I've submitted my CV. Yeah. Which has accurate details. Yes, right. yes. And but uh, from, from, I must apologize. Yes. I might have left the PIC in 2009 then yeah. and went to Transnet in 2011. Yes. But I remember there was about 18 months yes. where uh, I was just doing gardening. Yeah. I, I, I've read somewhere that you left uh, PIC in 2010. Is that incorrect? It's possible because at the time when I was leaving the PIC, I kept saying to the board, that I would like to leave, and they kept uh, saying, stay for another six months, stay for another three months. Stay. My contract had ended. But uh, the importance of whether you left PIC in 2010 um, relates to when exactly do you leave, because I, I may have misunderstood you, but I thought you said you, you left PIC in 20, 2008. We can go to my CV, which oh, is okay, uh, okay, in the right. next year. Uh, and I think it is more accurate. Well, you, you haven't worked for too many employers. Uh, uh, I would have thought that you would uh, know, know <laughs> these things easily because you, you were just in the Premier's office in Limpopo, you were in National Treasury, you were in PIC, and then after that you were in but, but we only started there, Jefferson. Yeah? We, that's where we started. <laughs> <laughs> That's on page 46. Sorry. Page 46. 46? Yes. The CV. The CV. You're using the black numbers on the top left uh, of each page of a page. No. Four, six. Yeah, the CV starts at page 46. Yes. 2011 to 2015 at uh, Transnet, and June 2003 to July 2010 at the Public Investments Corporation. I'm sorry, Chairperson. On which correct. page? Yeah, I think I was right, Mr. Muleff. At page 48, yes. your CV says, uh, February 2011 to April 2015, you were Group Chief Executive of Transnet. Yes. Yeah, I was right about when you started at Transnet. Yes, sir. But w w what, we do, what we need to see is when you left PIC. Your memory is impeccable, Chapas. Hmm? <laughs> I say your memory is impeccable. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. I remember it, some things and I don't remember dangerous. other things. But I don't see, I don't know if you do deal with PIC here. You should it, be dealing with it, but I can't it is immediately there. see. It is there, Chair. Hmm? It is there. What uh, page? That's June 2003 to July 2010. Chief Executive Officer, Public Investment Corporation. On the oh, same on, page. On page 48. Yeah? Page 48. Yes, yes. Uh, where it says work experience. I can see that, so I think so. I was it starts right. with ESCOM, it goes to Transnet, and it goes to PIC. Yeah, I think I was right also that you left PIC in 2010. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Okay, all right. Yeah, that is correct. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. I mean, just by way of a background, uh, Mr. Malif, uh, you know, the, the Gupta brothers. Mr. Salim, Esther, have become the highlight of the day. And um, just by way of a background, could you explain to the chairperson, starting first with the Gupta brothers, whether you had, you knew them, you had any relationship with them, of what kind? Uh, if you like, Chairperson, let me start with uh, Salim Essa because I think it's easier. I actually don't know Salim Essa. I've never met him. I don't know what he looks like. I hear about him. The Gupta brothers, I know. And um, I know all three of them, but the one that I know uh, that I had a lot of interactions with was, in fact, Mr. A.J. Gupta and not his two brothers. 
And uh, yeah, I know Mr. A.J. Gupta. I've been to his house. Uh, I've been to their house. And uh, I have been there on numerous occasions uh, to attend family functions, uh, to have private meetings, a lot of times. So I know them. I, I know them quite well, especially Mr. A.J. Gupta. Okay. So I will not uh, try to say to you that I don't know them yes, like yes. it is fashionable to do. Yes, yes. yes. Mm. Okay. Can you also tell the chairperson, according to your recollection, when did you come to know them? Chairperson, it's a very long story. And... Uh, but I believe you have the time. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that first sentence. I say it's a very long story. Oh, okay. Well, uh, needing would it take five, ten minutes? No more. <laughs> Much more than that? Yes. <laughs> okay. The commission will go over budget. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's first give you 15 minutes and see whether that will, yes. that will do. Tell us. Uh, yes. While I was at the PIC, I was called by Dr. Mutsunyani. Doctor? Mutsunyani. Yes. Sam Mutsunyani. Sam, Sam Mutsunyani. Yes. Okay. And he asked me to come to his house on a Saturday afternoon. Mm. And we sat under a tree. Mm. And they made us tea. <laughs> and he told me a very long story, long, painful story. He said to me that uh, in 1964, an idea occurred to him that part of the problem that uh, African people were not progressing was access to credit. And yet, they were classified as high risks by the banks. And yet, the money that was in the banks was theirs because they make deposits. So, he says it occurred to him that maybe what he should do is establish a bank that would be an African bank. In fact, that is what it was called. And he says he went around all the townships and villages in South Africa trying to establish a bank. Trying to establish a bank. And um, there were no hotels there. In fact, the hotels that were there did not take black people in the 60s and the 70s. And he slept in people's houses and told them about this idea of establishing a bank. And um, they donated money towards the establishment of the bank. These business people who owned cafes and butcheries and African people that were not allowed to be involved in manufacturing by legislation at the time. So it took him 10 years to raise 1 million rand with which to establish a bank. And then, um, when he had raised that one million rand, he says he spoke to the ANC about it, and they gave their blessings, but also directed him to go to London and speak to Butlis, and he did. And Butlis said, we will help you. And they gave him the nine million rand. And he came to South Africa and he had 10 million rand with which to establish a bank. And he came to South Africa and had to apply for a banking license from the Reserve Bank. And uh, the Reserve Bank did not refuse. They gave him a banking license with Butlis, but put onerous conditions, including the board membership of the bank and all sorts of things. It was incidentally headquartered in Harangua, which is where I am from. And um, I remember it very well. It was in Zone 16, next to the cinema there, Mokoko. So um, he says, because of the conditions of the Reserve Bank, the bank struggled. For example, they were not allowed to open current accounts. And yet their clients, were business people from the township. They had to come and withdraw cash to go to macro, to metro and to macro every Friday to buy stock. So they could not just go and sign checks there. 
Um, and it was very painful experience under the, under the supervision of a very hostile reserve bank at the time. To cut a long story short, Jefferson, his point was, Mulefe, you are now CEO of the PIC. It controls so many billion rands. The governor of the Reserve Bank is a black man who comes from the ANC. And uh, the ANC is in power. The ANC that had bought into this idea in the first place, in the 70s. And uh, which means uh, what is so difficult for you guys? And Jefferson, those were very, very, those were, I took those words to heart. And uh, I went back to the PIC, and um, I think it was- He was saying, in effect, look what I did under very difficult exactly. conditions with hostility coming from the Reserve Bank, and it was apartheid government. Now you have an ANC government, you have the ANC here, you have a governor, of the Reserve Bank, who, is, who has the background of the ANC, is black. The, president the conditions the... Are, should be much more exactly. easier for you to achieve this thing. To achieve this thing, to capture the savings of African people yes, yes. with the purpose of reinvesting them. Reinvesting them to advance and improve the, the conditions. He was saying, what is your problem? He says, yeah, he's, actually, he, he didn't say what is he's, he's, mm -hmm. I think what is your problem is mild. Mm -hmm. Yeah, why are you failing? <laughs> why are you failing? <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. So, Jefferson, I mean, it gave me sleepless nights. And uh, I came back and thought about this thing. At about the same time, there was a rumor that the net bank is for sale. And I decided that maybe what we should do is take net bank <laughs> and, uh, and transform it into this bank that uh, Mr. Mutsunyana was talking about. So I mulled over the idea, I contacted net bank it is owned by Old Mutual. They confirmed that NetBank was indeed for sale. They had advisors who were supposed to oversee the sale, expressed by interest. And they agreed. And they said, but Mulefe, can you raise the capital? I said, I will try. And uh, I left the PIC to go on this mission. And, uh, and I went to London uh, to speak to people there about uh, doing this um, and uh, I even thought of uh, maybe we could buy some other banks like uh, Standard uh, um, not Standard Bank the, the one that's outside South Africa yeah while well, Mr. Malifa is thinking, Chair. Yeah, I'll uh, remember it now, but it's, it's standard something. But yeah, anyway. Mr. Malifa, sorry. I, I, say, I was saying to the Chairperson, while you are thinking, I must remind you that your pilot experience and estimation of time should not fail me. Well, the Chairperson just gave me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, Chairperson, in South Africa, there was a family that had come from India, mm. had established themselves as business people, and uh, had opened a computer company. And, um, well, I heard that they were doing quite well. And I went to them and I asked, if one wants to establish a bank, what, where can one get the capital? How can one raise the capital to establish such a bank? And they said, that is very interesting. You know, in India, we have banks that are Indian-owned, that are our banks, like, like Bank of Baroda uh, and several others. 
Uh, let us speak to some people in uh, England, I mean in uh, India, to see if uh, they will be able to assist him. And they did. I'm not sure if I should mention who they spoke to, but they spoke to one of the richest people in India. I met him. Uh, I'm just reluctant to release his name now. And he agreed. And um, he said, we'll do the deal. After five minutes of discussion, I said, I'll help you buy net bank. I was happy, I was elated. And uh, <clears throat> we went to the Reserve Bank with this uh, person and the Guptas and, and, and uh, Mr. A.J. Gupta. And we got to the Reserve Bank and the banking supervision said, no, we can't allow this to happen. Net bank can't be sold. We've already sold Standard Bank to the Chinese. We've already sold um, APSA to uh, the, the English. Uh, I remember when uh, the, the, the Butler's Bank came to the PIC when I was CEO to say that they would like to buy APSA. And I said to them, I didn't think that the anglo Boer war would end like this. <laughs> and anyway, uh, but then they, the Reserve Bank was reluctant to proceed. And um, with the Reserve Bank reluctant to proceed, uh, the governor was Mr. Mboweni. I don't know if I'm implicating him, but he was Mr. Mboen. And I even saw him. We had a quote for this. If you ask him what is the Hroblas Dal minute, he will tell you what it is. It was about a black bank. It was about buying net bank. So <clears throat> it was turned down by the Reserve Bank. So we didn't proceed. And so I was left. Then I thought I'd establish a property company. Uh, I spoke to Investec and they were prepared to help in however way they could help. And then one day. Uh, don't speak too far away from your mic. Your... Yes, Jeff. Yeah, okay. And then one day I got a call, not from the Guptas, from a headhunter called Brian, no, I'm talking about, what am I, I'm talking about Transnet now. Oh, how I know the Guptas. <laughs> okay, that is how I know them, Chairperson. Because this one, now I'm going to Transnet. <laughs> now I'm going to how I went to Transnet. Yeah. But, uh, but that is how I got to know them. Mm. Uh, we're doing this deal. Mm. And right through the years, Chairperson, we never stopped talking about this bank. Mm. And even up to today, mm. I'm still talking about it. Mm. And even up to today, mm. I'm still on that mission, Chairperson, of uh, Dr. Mozunyan. Hopefully, before he passes on, we can make him proud. Mm. Mm. <laughs> okay, okay, sir. Mr. Selega. Thank you, Chair. So the, the interaction with them dates uh, uh, a while back when you were at PIC. And um, it seems in that process, as you say, you came to know them very well. Yes. Just keep your microphone on. I, I can also mention that while I was at the PIC, they also tried to do deals there. They also tried to do deals there. Yeah, with the PIC. Please look this side so I can hear. They tried to do deals with the PIC. They submitted funding applications. Yes. And they were not approved while I was there. Yes. 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 Yeah. So not a, there's not a single deal that they did with the PIC when I was there. Mm. Yeah. Are you able to remember when it was you started interacting with them while you were at PIC uh, uh, from around which year? Yeah, Jefferson, maybe around 2007, 2008. Yeah. As, okay. as you've seen, okay. I can't even remember my own life. Okay, but no, no, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. We won't hold you to it. <laughs> Just want an idea. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And and Continue. we well talking about deals. 
Uh, sorry, um, I'm just going out of sequence a bit, but we will come to it. Talking about deals, uh, Mr. Malefe, we know that uh, at least at, at ESCOM, to, to get uh, which was oh, uh, having links with the Gupta brothers. Yes. Did get deals at, 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 run, at ESCOM. They did. They did. I, and, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Selega, I'm, I know I'm interrupting you. Yes, sure. uh, Before you get to Tegeta, let me ask some question to Mr. Mulefe. So you started interacting with the Gupta brothers, Gupta family, around 2008, that's your estimate, yes. 2007, 2008, you are not yes. sure. Uh, and you said earlier on, uh, you have been to their house, and I think you said yes. many times, is that right? Come again? Uh, I think you said many times, is that yeah, right? Yeah, several times. Several times, Yeah, yes, actually, yes. over the years, I mean, yes, I, yes. I've lost count, actually, yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, I saw nothing wrong or abhorrent yes, in yes. going to their house. Yes. Uh, I saw them Jefferson, mm. as people yes. in South Africa yes. who enjoy the rights yes. that are in our constitution. Yes. I yes. had no reason yeah. to treat them like uh, lepers. Yes. Um, yes. As people pretend that they did mm. at the time when they mm. met them for the first time. Mm. Uh, mm. It was a normal relationship that mm. I had with mm. people that I had approached yes, and who yes. had received us warmly to say, yes. uh, let's, uh, let's talk about establishing mm. this uh, institution. Yeah. They were foreigners that had come to South Africa, but yes. they were prepared mm. to buy into the vision mm. of a bank mm. that would belong to Africans. They were yes. prepared to buy into the vision yes. of, uh, of taking that bank and uh, making it a bank of Africans, yes. or like the African bank, as had been uh, 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 the vision mm. of mm. Uh, Dr. Mozoniane. Yes. A lot of uh, our own South African business people mm. did not buy into that vision. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I, no. I don't want to go into names, but I actually at the time spoke to a lot of people who, who thought that, uh, look, yeah, no, that's fine. Um, I, I assume that as the years went by from around 2007, 2008, when you started interacting with, yes. with them, uh, did your relationship with them get stronger? Did you get closer in terms of uh, the personal uh, relationship or professional, whatever it was? Yeah, I can say close. Yes. It depends on how you define clothes. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah but there were people that uh, uh, I knew. You interacted with I regularly. interacted with. We yeah. had tried to do this thing. Yes. It had not succeeded. Yes. And uh, the vision was kept alive. Yes. Even when the Reserve Bank turned us down, mm. uh, we said, I said to them that uh, it does not mean that we must give up. Yeah. And Whenever they were, there was information, mm. uh, we would discuss it. For example, mm. uh, Bank of Baroda mm. at some point became our target. Mm. Uh, it operates very successfully in Tanzania. Mm. Uh, and in fact, uh, I, have, I have paid a lot of visits to Tanzania. And yeah. I just made it my business to see, see some of the branches of uh, Bank of Baroda in Tanzania. There was another one that operates out of Togo. It's a, it's a Eco Bank mm. in Togo. Mm. Uh, that one, in fact, to Jefferson, Net Bank, they asked me if you became, if you bought this bank and you became CEO of the bank, what would you do? Mm. I said, you know what your problem is as net banking? And, and I, now I realized that I was naive because I gave them a very important strategic um, thing that I had thought about. And it was even before we did the deal. Uh, I said, the biggest bank in Africa 
with the widest reach is actually EcoBank. It has more branches than any other bank in South Africa. It started in Nigeria. Most of its operations are in Nigeria. Its headquarters is in Lome. I don't know if you've ever been to Lome, Jefferson. It's a very interesting place. Uh, you see this uh, market in, um, in town where they sell African traditional things. What's it called? Uh, Mai Mai. Ooh, there's a big one there. Uh, where they sell all sorts of things. And, but anyway, I went there and I saw it, the head office. I didn't go inside, just from outside. And uh, it's a very impressive operations, but the problem with it is that their operations have not modernized. So they may be the bank with the largest reach of branches, but they don't have the, uh, at the time the issue was uh, these uh, ATMs. And now it would be cell phone banking. Yeah, so they were not moving with the times. So I thought that if you, if you net bank and you buy EcoBank and you modernize it with the reach on the whole continent, you've done something very big. And, uh, and the deal didn't happen with NetBank, but NetBank went and bought EcoBank. But then they didn't do what needed to be done. They also did other things. NetBank at the time only had outside the country. They were only in Lesotho and Namibia. And I thought, what is your reluctance to go outside of the, the, the South Africa? Well, of course, we know the reason. The reason is because NetBank actually is a Netherlands bank. It came from the Netherlands. So, and it was a, uh, an Afrikaner bank for a very long time. Uh, and perhaps that is why they never left South Africa. But um, uh, they bought EcoBank with the PIC after I had left. So we would meet with the Guptas and talk about this and say, hey, look at what your friends are doing. Uh, Baroda, so so, and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah. So we would discuss yeah. issues most of the time not relating to Transnet or ESCO, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. Salega. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Morning, you. Um, Mr. Malefe, in so far, as Mr. Salim Essa is concerned. I did say that I will ask you this question about Mr. Hank Bester. Yes. Yes. Remember, Mr. Hank Bester says he had a meeting in 2014 miss, with Mr. Salim Essa. Yes. And uh, in, during the course of that meeting, Mr. Salim Essa said to show you how powerful we are, something to that effect. Um, we have decided that Mr. Brown Molefe is going to be the CEO of ESCOM. Yes. That, that is in 2014, before the announcement of, for your secondment in, in was 20, made. 2014. 2014, yes. Yes. So, um, how is it that he knew you and you say he, you didn't know him uh, based on that, that incident? Mr. Salim Essa. Yes, Mr. Salim Essa. And you can say that, tell the chat person what you said you're going to say. What I said? What you say will be your response to that question. Yes, chairperson. I was sitting at uh, Rocco Mamas. At Rocco Mamas. Uh -huh. You know Rocco Mamas, chairperson? Uh -huh. it's, uh, it's happening there. It's not a Shabin, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It's a restaurant that sells mm. very nice hamburgers. Mm. And not far from my table, there were two Indian ladies. Mm. Is, that, was, is that in 2014? Did you say yes. Indian ladies? Eh? Did you say Indian ladies? Yes. Okay. Yes. I think they're sisters from the way that they looked. But I could overhear their conversation. And one of them kept saying that uh, Mr. Zondo is going to be the next Chief Justice. I just think it would be unfair to ask you to comment on that. It's exactly the same thing. <laughs> no, 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 no. And, and, see, and, that, you, and that Mr. Slicker would be the deputy chief justice. No, no, you, <laughs> no, no there, 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 there is nothing wrong in being 
in, in SA, look, I, I can't comment. Uh, I don't know where he got that information from. Oh. If that's, yeah, there's nothing wrong with, with that if you don't know. Oh. But if you, you may well have an idea where yes. he might have got that from, in which case you say. But when you have no idea, you have no idea. So you also don't know? Hmm? So you also don't know where what? they got it from? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know that person where, where that conversation came from, where it was going. I was not there. I have, uh, in fact, I, I don't know Mr. Salim S. I've never met him. Yeah. Uh, do, well, do, 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 did you know people that know him from whom he might have got that information, as no. far as you know, or? You have no reason to think that he got it from anybody that you knew? You know? No, I actually, Chairperson, I don't know where he you got it You don't know where, yeah. It's just like a lot of the rumors that go yeah. round and round yeah. and round and round. In fact, it is not something that uh, I would normally apply my mind to mm. and worry about mm. and stress about mm. and try to find out where it came yeah. from. Because yeah. it is just... Uh, yeah. It happens every day, Jefferson, that yes. somebody had somebody somebody was told mm. in the corridor of a house, mm. a strange house that he doesn't know, mm. that uh, about me. And he doesn't even know who that person is. Uh, I I don't attach a lot of weight to. No, no, that's that, that's fair enough. Uh, uh, part of the reason why Mr. Selega is asking is so that if you do know something, you can oh. share it. If you don't know, you don't know. No, I uh, don't there's know. No. I but don't know I think we may as well mention this, even though it might relate to Transnet, and uh, uh, you might be able to deal with it. You might, if you say you would prefer to deal with it when you come back no, to no. deal with Transnet, that would be fine. Now, I want to, to say you, you would know, I assume, that um, in 2010, December, uh, the New Age, which was uh, a newspaper owned by the Guptas, uh, ran an article, had an article, I don't know if it was December 6 or December 10, 2010, which was either saying Mr. Brian Mulefe is going to be the next group CEO of Transnet or the next boss of Transnet, or whether it was simply saying it is likely that Mr. Brian Mulefe is going to be the next group CEO of Transnet. Yes. Uh, have, you, have you heard about that article? Yes. You, yes, you heard I've heard about it. it. I also heard you talk about it here. Yes, yes. Uh, you don't, don't know, know where they got that information I from. I don't know. Do, did they say in the article where they got the information Sorry? From? Did they say in the article where they got the information from? Um, I've read the article, if I, uh, if I recall correctly, but I can't remember whether... I, 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 probably I don't think they would say. Uh, they might say certain reliable sources that had told did, them. Did, you, did, you, did, did, did the article say who it was written by? I'm, sh I'm sure it, it, it should show. Uh, the, I think the legal team can just make arrangements to make a copy of that article available to Mr. No, I, I, I know about it. The, the yeah. point that I was trying to make is, mm. did the commission therefore ask the person who wrote the article, where did you get that well, information? Well, the, the commission's investigations are ongoing. Oh. Uh, uh, but the, the, what I wanted you to be able to say something about, if you are able to, is to say we have a situation where it seems in 2010, a newspaper that is owned by the Gupta family or their entities seems to predict that you are going to be the next group CEO of Transnet. And it actually, that does happen and then in 2014, according to Mr. Hank Bester, who gave evidence here, he meets with Mr. Salim Essa on some issue relating to transnet business or contract. And uh, Mr. Salim Essa wants Mr. Bester's company to work with his company. And uh, uh, according to Mr. Bester, in an attempt to show 
that they, I assume Mr. Salim Essa and whoever else he was talking about, are powerful people. He decided to tell him that, you know, we know that the, uh, Mr. Brian Mulefe is going to be the next boss of ESCOM. And in, a, in less than a year, that, that does happen. You know. So you might say, look, I don't have comment. I don't know where that came from. Uh, that, 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 that's fine. But it's fair to just say, there is this. Do you have something to say about it? Do you know anything about it? No, I don't know anything about it. I did hear about the article at the time. In fact, I was out of the country. And, uh, yeah, and uh, somebody just came to me and said, hey, have you seen what's on social media? Uh, and then I said, I don't know what this is all about. And uh, it was the end of the matter as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, okay. Mr. Thank Sir, you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Malefe, let's... You, let's deal with your secondment, because it has also come up here uh, a couple of times, from your secondment from Transnet to ESCO. Tell the chairperson, how did that come about? Who approaches you and what do they say to you? Chairperson, to they can't... Okay. I'm giving you two minutes. Keep your mic on, Mr. Oh, Murphy. Yeah, just keep proceed? it on. As you can see, Chairperson, I'm very eager to help the Commission. <laughs> I, I, did, I didn't hear that. I say, as you can see, I'm very eager to help the Commission. <laughs> yes. Uh, Chairperson, um, as you remember, in 2014 15, the country suffered debilitating load shedding. It was so bad, Chairperson, that one day I went to a bank. I wanted to go inside the bank at Irene Mall, which is a small mall. And I found the bank manager, Standard Bank bank manager, standing outside the bank. And he said, sorry, the bank is closed. <laughs> I, I had never imagined that South Africa could come to that. That on a weekday, I think it was Wednesday. I assume it, he said what was closed because of load shedding. Load shedding. Yeah. It was in the middle of load shedding. Mm -hmm. The bank was closed. Uh, at, uh, around 10, 11 in the morning on a weekday, the bank manager was standing outside the bank and said, the bank is closed. And um, I was at Transnet. We were trying to ramp up uh, the uh, transportation of coal to Richards Bay because of the backlogs and so on and so forth with electric locomotives. There was a time when we were running about uh, 36 trains on the coal line to Richards Bay, scheduling them, uh, 36 trains in about uh, 24 to 30 hours. That's a lot of trains, electric trains. And it takes time and planning to schedule trains like that. And, uh, and it takes weeks for us to add a train, add a train, add a train, until you arrive at the point where you're running about one train every 45 minutes to Richards Bay. And then there would be load shedding on part of the line and the whole system collapses. And it takes three to four weeks, maybe even more, six weeks, to get the scheduling going on again. So it really frustrated me on all sorts of levels. And then one day, during a function, I think at the port of uh, Moha, Minister Brown said, if we asked you to go to Transnet, would you go? Transnet or Eskom? Sorry, Eskom. 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 Yeah, sorry, Chairperson. My life is... Uh, if we asked you to go to Eskom, would you go? Who asked you? Sorry. Minister Brown. Minister Brown. Lynn Brown. Lynn Brown, yes. And I said, yes. And she said, okay. And then a couple of days later, or maybe a week or so, and then she called back and said, okay, we're activating that thing. And she called back and said? We are activating it. Oh, okay. Yeah. You, you, you moved to ESCOM. Yes. Yeah. And I said, that's fine, Minister. 
And then, uh, so I was aware that she was working on it. So she would have done the communications to the board and so on. She spoke, we, we spoke, actually between me and her on this matter, we spoke very few words. Yes. She asked and I agreed. There was no long debate and mm -hmm. so on. And mm -hmm. from my side, it was like, South Africa is really collapsing. Mm. A bank is closed at mm. 10 o'clock in the morning mm. or at 11 o'clock in the morning. Mm. And I saw the devastation on the rail line. Mm. And I, I thought about what I was doing at the Transnet was uh, important, the implementation of the market demand strategy. Mm. Um, but I felt hey, ESCOM is more serious. Mm. If I can help there, I should go there. And um, and they activated it. She spoke to the boards. One day I was on my way to Cape Town. I remember it was a Friday afternoon. No, Thursday afternoon. I had been invited to speak as a, a guest at the graduation ceremony of, uh, I think it was the Technicon, the, 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 the Technicon in Cape Town. Western Cape Technicon. I don't know what they call it now. And uh, she, and I said, where? She said, where are you? I said, I'm at the airport. I'm going to Cape Town. She says, don't go. We're making the announcement tomorrow. And I called Mr. Carl Sultikwa, uh, who was the CEO of uh, Transport Port Terminals. And I asked my PA to email him my speech at the graduation and asked him to go to Cape Town and deliver that speech. He was in Devon. And then I stayed, and she said, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, you must be at ESCO on Friday. And then she made the announcement. We know that uh, she made the announcement, I think, on the 17th of April, 2015. Yes, that's, that's correct. Sir. Yes. yes. So uh, even if you don't remember the exact date when she, that is Minister Brown, raised this issue with you for the first time. How long before the 17th of April do you think it was? How much time lapsed between the time when she raised it for the first time with you and the yeah. day when it was announced? Maybe a, a week, week or a, a week and a half, something like that. A week or a week, or and, a week half. and a half. A week and a half, yeah. Oh, okay, she right. raised it with me. Uh, from what you say, it looks like she was the first person to mention yes. uh, the possibility of you moving to ESCOM. Yes. yes. And, and she managed the process of communicating to the boards that the boards had taken the appropriate decisions. Yes. This was done, and I think in one or, one or one, either one or both of them, it was an ex post approval, yes. which is allowable. Yes. Uh, but, uh, and then there was a proper agreement that was signed, mm. and I went to ESCOM. Is your, would it be fair to say uh, your understanding was that she managed the whole process yes. of your move from Transnet yes. to ESCOM? Yes. Okay. And, and Chairperson, she was the shareholder of both companies. Yes. Representative yes. shareholder, 100% shareholding. <laughs> yeah. They were hers. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, they belong to the government. So yes. if the government said, uh, look, we must move from here to there, Mm. to help there. Mm. At the time, she said, you'll come back yeah. to Transnet. It's just yes. a secondment, just mm. to, there are certain things that I don't understand at uh, ESCOM. Mm. For example, she says, they're telling me that they can't pay salaries in two months. Majid Zimokolo repeated it yesterday, that uh, at that time, they were not going to be able to pay salaries. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mr. Selega. Thank you. Um, Mr. Malefe, during that time, did you know, or even prior to that time, did you know Dr. Ngubani? No, no, I, I did not know Dr. Ngubani before I got to, I know about him. Hmm. In fact, uh, he was uh, the ambassador to Japan. Yeah. And, uh, Face the chairperson. Sorry? Face to the chairperson. Yes, yes. <laughs> sorry, sorry, chairperson. Uh, he was the ambassador to Japan. And I think, uh, I'm not sure if my memory... He had been a cabinet minister at some stage before that as well. He had been a cabinet and minister, but in Japan... And he had been at some stage. Yeah, I can't remember if he was still ambassador, but we went there and we did a deal. 
Japan? Yeah, a, a, a Japanese yen deal. We while he was the ambassador. While he was, so we did a deal in the markets for South Africa. Mm -hmm. South Africa issued a, a yen bond. And we went to Japan to sell the bond to Japanese investors. I think I may have been with uh, Ms. Uh, Makato. She was the head of foreign funding. And uh, while he was there, while we were there uh, doing the deal as a delegation representing the South African government, uh, he hosted us. I think that was the first time that I had actually interacted with him closely. And then for many years, I never interacted with him until, uh, until ESCO. What, do you, what, what name did you use? You, the first time you interacted with who? Dr. Ngubani. Oh, is that the name you used? I thought you used a different name. No, I don't know his name, Diguere, if you okay. have one. <laughs> um, the reason I'm asking is because uh, Ms. Matietim Kolo mm. says prior to the decision being made for you to be seconded, the minister, Minister Lynn Brown, gets called, gets called to a meeting at ESCOM with Dr. Ngubani. At the time, he's an acting uh, chairperson of ESCOM board. In that meeting, when they arrived, that is the minister and Ms. Mkolo, they find the chairperson of Transnet, Linda, Ms. Linda Mabaso, they find Dr. Ngubani, and Mr. Zitembe Koza, who was at the time the acting CEO. Yes. Mm. And according to her impression, the person who introduces the idea of your secondment to ESCOM is Dr. Ngubani. So that's the reason why I'm asking you whether no, did you know Dr. Ngubani I, at the time? I can't comment on that meeting, Chairperson. I don't know anything about it. I wasn't mm. there. Uh, in fact, I was I, not aware that they I, had done I such a meeting. I think, Mr. Selega, you may have understood uh, uh, evidence like that, but I understood her, I think I understood her to be saying at the meeting the person who raised the subject. Who? Well, the person who raised oh, the yes. subject was Dr. Ngubane, which I didn't necessarily understand to be, to say there may not have been discussions prior to that meeting yes which she might have known nothing about yes um, yeah yes yeah. no that's 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 a fair assessment here because i must also say in addition to that chairperson the same question was put to dr ngubani mm. and dr ngubani said this was a follow-up meeting according to him so there were uh, there was a meeting before and this was a follow-up meeting according to dr ngubani it was the minister who asked them to second you, who suggested that you be seconded to, to ask I, Yes, I think uh, Dr. Ngubane's evidence seems to be consistent with Mr. Mulefe's evidence. Correct. Because Mr. Mulefe says the yes. first person who raised this issue with me yes. of moving to ESCOM was Minister Brown. Yes. Dr. Ngubane said that uh, the idea that uh, Mr. Mulefe should be moved to ESCOM came from Minister Brown. Minister Brown. So, yes. um, I, I think yeah. uh, that, that, that's, yeah, that's consistent. Yeah. Chairperson, yes. I was referring to my consciousness. Yes. yes. So the first time I got to know it is when the minister literally mm. calls me aside during a function with many people and we speak in low tones and she says, would you go to ESCO? It didn't take three minutes. And, uh, and that was it. So yeah. I don't know what happened before and after. Yeah, no, 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 yeah. that's fine, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's all right. Um, yeah, because just, just for your information, I'm not, you, you may comment, you may not be able to. You see how the dots connect is because mm -hmm. the central figure, <laughs> I see you laughing, the central figure in this is uh, Mr. Salim Essa, who, as we have already, uh, uh, indicated to you the evidence of Mr. Henk Bester in 2014 who says this is what Mr. Salim Essa said. We have already decided that Mr. Malefia will be the CEO of ESCOM. 
Wait. Then you have, on the 10th of March, 2015, when Ms. Suzanne Daniels goes to Melrose Arch, Mr. Salim Essa introduces himself as the minister's advice to her. Um, and that refers to Minister Lynn Brown. Then you have, again, the involvement, the involvement of Mr. Essa when Mr. Tsuti does the composition of the subcommittees of the ESCOM board, that Mr. Essa proposes to him who should be on those subcommittees. And Minister Lynn Brown gives Mr. Tsuti the same names or list of names that had been received from Mr. Salim Essa. And Mr. Tsoti is called to the minister's office where, according to him, he finds the minister with Mr. Tony Gupta and Mr. Salim Essa. Mm -hmm. And the minister insists on a particular list for the composition of the subcommittees. Um, so, when the minister then comes to you, it seems that there is more than just the minister behind the decision for your secondment. You may want to comment or you have no comment. I'm just painting the picture to you. I'm, I'm tempted to comment. Chairperson, if you can observe events, um, some of them imagined, some of them real. Um, and you observe them either in your head or outside happening. And then you decide that you would like to paint a picture. You can paint any picture. These dots, these mythical dots, can be construed from anything. Related events or unrelated events. You can take things that happen, that happen in a particular way as a result of coincidence, that happen in... I'm telling you that I don't know about these meetings. I don't know Mr. Salim. Yes, Yeser. yes. And yes. yet, you take all these events that were happening. Mm. Well, I can even ask, I mean, on the day that Mr. Besta and Mr. Salim Esa had that meeting, was it raining? Mm. And was the fact that it was raining part of the dots? Mm. Mm. Or was it a full moon? Mm. Or uh, anything can be connected to anything, Chaperson. Mm. Mm. People who come here and say they are connecting a dot. Mm. I mean, as I'm sitting here, I can look at the sky and imagine a lion mm. and actually connect the dots. Mm -hmm between the different stars, the stars at night. Uh -huh. You can see a lion if you look very carefully, uh -huh. if you connect the dots. Uh -huh. So, Chairperson, I, in law, there was a, I don't know, I never studied law. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know a lot of people who did, but I didn't. Uh, mm. But there is a theory of causation. Mm. What if somebody uh, wakes up in the morning and starts by going to the bathroom and comes back and sleeps in the kitchen. What was the cause of death? Is it the fact that they woke up and went to the bathroom? But because they, so you can connect dots to anything. And in fact, this, this is a matter actually in law that is dealt with quite extensively about the theory of causation. You cannot go and find all sundry events and try to connect them and found, find causation. Okay. I, think, I think they call it the theory of causation, approximate causation, not mm -hmm. all the events that were happening in a restaurant mm -hmm. in, uh, in Melrose Arch, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. or a discussion that people had on yeah. a rainy Sunday evening, mm -hmm. and say that it is, you know, uh, after I, they I left think, that day, maybe I, somebody, I th somebody got to a traffic light and caused an accident. You yes. could say that it was because of that discussion. I think it's fair enough, the, your response, that you were not in those meetings. Yes, I was not yeah. in those meetings. Let's yeah. leave it there, Chairman. I think, I think we can ignore the fact that I tried to venture into the law. Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, 
But uh, you remember we spoke about perspectives, even if it's the same facts. Um, uh, part of this is for you to be able to say, well, I don't know about this and that, but there is a flaw in this reasoning when you try to connect this and this and this, as I see it. So I wasn't there, but this doesn't connect. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so that perspective. But if you say, look, I don't think that... Um, uh, this means anything really. Uh, I mean, that, that, that's, that's, yeah. that, that's fine. I, I think, therefore, Chair, my comment, to be fair to Mr. Sibiga, yeah. is to say that I note that you're talking about events that happened that I was not aware of, most of them. Uh, they may or may not be forming a picture. I cannot definit definitively say, and I don't think anyone can, say that there is a picture that you draw from events that are carefully selected to paint a picture. Sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you, Chair. Yes. Um, well, maybe we, for the sake of completeness, we may as well also mention this, and if you have got uh, something to say, you, 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 you can use the opportunity to say it. If you really have nothing to say, you can, uh, you don't have to say anything. Uh, that um, uh, in, uh, according to Mr. Mkabisi Jonas, yes. yeah, he gave evidence in the commission and said he had a meeting at uh, the Gupta residence on the 23rd of October 2015. Yes. He said uh, Mr. Tuduzane Zuma was in that meeting, Mr. Shongwane was in that meeting, Fana Shongwane, and uh, he said there was uh, a, a Gupta brother that was there. I think initially he said it was Mr. Ajay Gupta, uh, but I think later on he said uh, he was not sure about uh, whether it was Mr. Ajay Gupta or one of the other So he, he, did, he doesn't know who said it? Uh, uh, but what did emerge uh, through the investigation of the commission, I think, is that, and I think Mr. Tutuzani Zuma accepted, is that Mr. Tony Gupta was in the house on, on, on the day of that meeting. Uh, but Mr. Tiruzani Zuma and Mr. Shongwane, their version is Mr. Tony Gupta was not part of the meeting. He popped in at some stage and wanted to speak to, 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 to Mr. Tiruzani Zuma, uh, but he was not part of the meeting. But Mr. Jonas was adamant that there was a Gupta brother who was uh, having a meeting with him. He said the two, namely Tuzani Zuma and Mr. Shongwan, were quiet most of the time. It was just that Gupta brother and himself were talking. One of the things that uh, he said, the, um, the Gupta brother said, was that um, one, uh, Mr. Ntlantlanene was going to be fired as Minister of Finance uh, because he was uh, not cooperating with them or not working with them or something to that effect. Um, and we do know that about six weeks later, Mr. Nene was fired as Minister of Finance. And then he, according to Mr. Jonas, um, he of, uh, he wanted him to uh, agree to take the job of being Minister of Finance and offered him some money. But one of the things that uh, he says, the Gupta brother who he says was talking to him, that he said was that there were certain people that they um, were working with and uh, among those he mentioned um, Minister Lynn Brown, and he men mentioned you. And according to Mr. Jonas, uh, the Gupta brother who was there 
said, among other things, that uh, Mr. Mr. Brian Leffes or Brian Leffes career is well taken care of. I'm, I'm using my own words, something to that effect. Uh, so there is that, there is that uh, as well. You might say, look, one, I wasn't in that meeting. I don't know what uh, they were talking about. I don't have any comment. Or I do have some comment, but I just want to make sure that you are aware that there is this evidence that Mr. Jonas gave. And if it's something that you hadn't looked at and you would rather deal with it later when you come back, that's, that's fine as well. But if you say, look, I have no comments about it, that's also fine. Yeah, Chairperson, the evidence of Mr. Jonas, he says he was at that house. I think I remember that he said uh, somebody was in the passage. They met in a passage. He doesn't know who that person is. Even as you are describing now, he thought it was so-and-so, but then maybe it could have been so-and-so and so. And uh, that person who he does not know said, uh, we are taking care of Mr. Brian Molefe's career. Now, um, the weight of that evidence is uh, very um, is, is light. It cannot be heavy. It cannot have a lot of... Even though this is a, an inquiry, uh, and, and this inquiry can accept uh, hearsay, because that's, that's what it is. It's hearsay. Even though it's an inquiry that can accept hearsay, but the quality of that hearsay is actually very bad because he doesn't know who he had it from uh, in the first place. And um, he says that he, he, uh, uh, he... I think he even said that that person was not part of the meeting. Well, he said the Gupta brother was uh, part now, of the, the meeting. Now, the person who said that who talked about me was not part of the meeting. Sorry? He said the person who talked about me was not part of the meeting. No, no, no. The, the, the person that Mr. Jonas said said these things about you was the Gupta brother that he said he was having a meeting with. Oh, I thought he said it was somebody who was passing on the passage. No, or no. <laughs> okay, but I, 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 I can't comment on it. I deny that uh, there is any Gupta person who was responsible for my career. Uh, I was responsible for my career. And, uh, and that, um, especially because um, that hearsay evidence is not even corroborated by anyone. Nobody else overheard what they were saying or came here to say that uh, we are taking care of Mr. Molefe's uh, career. Uh, I don't know whether it happened or that Mr. Jonas is remembering it wrong or it's just a figment of his imagination or that he can't distinguish it from something that he dreamt to something that really happened. I don't know, but I can tell you now, as uh, under oath, as evidence, that there was no Gupta brother that took care of my career. Yes. Um, I, 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 I don't want to, to say took care but of your career. But I think in my recollection of Mr. Jonas' evidence is that it was something like uh, your, your, your career is taken care of, uh, maybe not necessarily by them, but your <laughs> career is, is, is yeah. you will be fine in terms of career. But let, let, let's complete the, the, the whole thing because we, are, we, we have now talked about it. I mean, I, I, I don't know what finding I will make about Mr. Jonas's evidence and Mr. Tutuzani's evidence and Mr. Kilwane's evidence about that meeting, well, well, what I will ultimately find to be the case. But if I were to find that indeed Mr. Jonas was told these things by 
a, a Gupta brother in that meeting. Uh, and he was made the offer that he said he was made, uh, that if he agreed to be Minister of Finance and work with them, blah, 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 blah. Uh, it may well be that the, and the fact that that Gupta brother seems to have known in October already that Minister Nene was going to be fired as Minister of Finance. It may well be that it would be reasonable to say it looks like the Gupta brothers were looking to get a minister of finance for the, for, 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 for the government who would meet with their approval. And, uh, uh, I've had evidence about um, Mr. Uh, Van Royen, who was appointed as Mr. Nene's successor. He has given evidence here as well. He indicated the number of interactions that he had with, um, I think, one or other of the Gupta brothers between October and December before he was he was appointed, and there has been evidence about the advisors that he appointed, um, uh, and, uh, that is Mr. Van Rooyen. And there is um, the investigation of the commission uh, led it to ask some of the people who were officials of the ANC in um, March 2017, I think that's when Mr. Gordon was fired as Minister of Finance, uh. asked uh, what reasons uh, Mr. Zuma may have told them why he was uh, uh, firing Mr. Gordon, and they filed affidavits, Mr. Mantashe, Dr. Zulim Kizu was Treasurer General at the time, Mr. Mantashe was SG, and Ms. Jesse Duarte, they filed affidavits which are within the commission. And if uh, you have not been given copies, you should be given copies. One of the things they say is that, yes, Mr. Zuma did discuss or tell them his plan to uh, uh, fire or leave out of cabinet Mr. Gordon. And they say he told them that he wanted to replace Mr. Gordon as Minister of Finance with you. And uh, they say in those affidavits, uh, the officials of the ANC all rejected that idea. And uh, we do know, of course, that um, uh, the person who, uh, who replaced Mr. Gordon as Minister of Finance was then Mr. Kikaba. Uh, and in the meantime, I think in February 2017, if I'm not mistaken, you became a member of Parliament National Assembly. Uh, for a few months, I think in May you resigned and went back to ESCOM. Mm. So, so you might be able to say, look, I have no comment really on, on these things, but I, I mentioned them, and if you haven't been given uh, the affidavits that I'm talking about, uh, arrangements should be made for you to, mm. been, to be given, and if you want to say, let me read the affidavits first and deal with this issue later, Mm. When I come back, that's acceptable as well. Mm. Yeah, but Chairperson, I, I feel it's a bit unfair that people come here and say that we were gossiping about Mr. Molefe in his absence. And that uh, I was at the house. I don't know about the, the, the fact that Mr. Jonas's meeting, whether it took place, 600 billion and so on. Uh, um, I'm not commenting about that. The fact that they talked about me at the meeting that I was not there and I'm not aware of. Uh, and it may have been Mr. Mkise and uh, a discussion at Lutuli House about me. It was gossiping because I was not there. Well, I don't think it's fair to say it was gossiping because this was the President of the country, Mr. Zuma, and President of the ANC talking to 
his to, to the top leadership of the ANC, the top five, top six, to say this is what I'm planning to do, and I guess he was. So they, they were that. they were talking about me. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and I was not there. <laughs> but I don't think it's fair to say they were gossiping. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what's the definition of gossip, but uh, I'm sure you talk about a lot of other people when they are not there, but you you wouldn't say you you are gossiping all the time. But that's what gossip is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but uh, especially but let's let not use the word gossip then. But they were talking about me, and I was not there, and I was not aware of the discussion. I don't know how that should reflect on me. No, no, no. That, that, that's the, the or, idea. Or how I should take accountability. No, no. The idea for those discussions that took place in my absence. No, as I said. Or how you know, I should then now, in a commission of inquiry, explain myself about discussion that took place in my absence about me. Well, you see, uh, as I say, you know, you, you might say, look, I know nothing about it and I have no comment about it, or you might have some comment. But a, a possible scenario might be that you might say, I don't know, you might, you might say, well, uh, I'm not surprised that Mr. Zuma mentioned to the officials of the ANC that he was, he wanted to, he wanted me to replace Mr. Gordon because he had actually contacted me and asked me whether I would be prepared and uh, I said I would be prepared, so I'm not surprised. But you might say, I'm surprised because nobody ever talked about that to me. So, that the, so the idea is just to enable you to say what you might know about these things. Yeah, I, I know nothing about it, Chairperson, and I will not comment on it. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I, one should emphasize that, Mr. Malefa, there is a process of investigation and gathering information. Ultimately, the law makes a decision based on the evidence presented if it is uncontroverted. But the decision is not made based on reading the stars or making imaginations. So we are in the process. But the end will be based on the evidence. Now, in addition to this secondment issue... Well, Mr. Selig, I just realized we've gone oh, past one o'clock. Yes, Chair. I, I think let's take the lunch adjournment. Indeed. We are at nine minutes past one. We will resume at ten past two. Thank you, Chair. We adjourn. Chair.